Hello everyone. In this geography video we're going to be looking at the formation of sediment cells. What they are, how they form, and the types of things that affect them. So firstly, what is a sediment cell? Well, this is a linked system of sources or inputs, transfers, and sinks and outputs. And it basically regulates a section of a coastline and all of the sediment along that coastline where it comes from, how it moves, and where it ends up. So in this image we can see uh, the sediment cells of the UK. Now the UK and Wales is divided into 11 primary sediment cells. This means that they are areas that are kind of closed systems. There is very very little input or output beyond these boundaries. The boundaries are regulated predominantly by large geological structures, such as headlands or estuaries. And because of the shape of the land, it is very, very hard for sediment to move outside of these zones. Sediment cells are created by inputs, or areas where they get sediment from. These are the sources that generate the sediment. For example, cliffs, um, which erode uh, the sediment, and also rivers that can bring sediment from inland. Some examples of sediment inputs are cliff erosion, onshore currents, river transport, aeolian or wind-blown sediment, sub-aerial processes, and marine organisms. I'll be going through some of these in a little bit more detail. One of the major inputs to a sediment cell is cliff erosion. This can be seen by wave action that comes into contact with the base of the cliff. It undercuts it, and eventually the cliff will collapse, as you can see in this photo, leaving behind a lot of sediment. The sediment then gets inputted into the system, taken away by waves, and moved to other parts of the sediment cell and coast. The second largest input is that of river transportation. So particles inside of the river are carried normally through four means, traction, saltation, suspension, and solution. And this depends on the size of the particle. And as you can see in the photos on the left, it gets transported down the river, and then all of this sediment gets taken into the sea as fine sediment and moved by the waves along the coast. Another large input is aeolian sediment. This is sediment that is carried by the wind. And this is very dominant in areas that are quite arid and quite dry. The wind will basically suspend a lot of particles inside of it, and the larger particles will bounce along the bottom. We call this saltation. And you can see this quite clearly in the photo in, say, sandstorms, or even just in uh, dust particles that are picked up by the wind. Sub-aerial processes can also contribute to sediment. These are basically weathering. So in other words, physical, chemical, and biological weathering can break up particles in situ, and these particles can fall into the sea and join the sediment. Another large input that you can get in certain areas of the world, in this case mainly tropical areas, could be a marine organism input. Now specifically this marine organism input that you can see over here is generated by um, these bumphead parrotfish. So the jaws of these bumphead parrotfish are able to uh, basically destroy parts of coral. They, they want to get the algae that grows on the surface of the coral to feed themselves. And then when they defecate in the water, they leave behind this fine particle of sand, uh, which you can see and what it does is that it helps build all of these beautiful tropical beaches that you're quite used to seeing in parts of the world, such as the Maldives or the Seychelles. The second part of the sediment cell is that of transfers. This is the movement of all of the sediment along the coastal area. And this can happen, uh, you know, for many different reasons, such as longshore drift, the swash and backwash of waves, it can be moved in tidal currents or ocean currents, or even sometimes along the beach, uh, like by wind as well. In this case, the most dominant or most typical way that sediment is transferred along the coast is through that of longshore drift. 
and this implies that the swash of the waves picks up the particle and it carries it in the direction that the wave and the predominant wind is blowing, and then the backwash brings it vertically down the beach, and this process repeats over and over again until we have a net movement of sand grains from one side of the beach all the way to the other part of the beach, and along the coast. The outputs or sinks of the sediment that complete the sediment cell are large structures where deposition dominates. These are landforms that are created by the deposition of the sediment, such as, you know, spits or offshore bars, um, like you can see in the photo. You can see uh, the photo of sand dunes and spits and uh, bars as well. It is important to see the sediment cells as a dynamic system. This means that they are constantly generating and changing the source and region um, of where the sediment comes from, including how it is transported. They basically create what's known as a dynamic equilibrium. This is when the inputs of sediment and the source region are balanced by the amount that is being deposited in the sinks. And it's dynamic because there is constant movement between this whole system, and it doesn't always stay exactly the same or to the same degree. Different circulations and different inputs and processes might generate different degrees of erosion, transportation and deposition. Let us presume, for example, that we have a large storm event. This is going to mean that there is going to probably be a lot more erosion that is going to be happening in certain parts of the sediment cell. We can also go something as cyclical as uh, seasonal change. During winter, when there are more waves and maybe stronger winds and bigger storms, this is going to affect the dynamic equilibrium. But then that will be balanced out by the milder weather that we get in the summer. Finally, you can see over here that these dynamic systems work in an intertwined fashion. And this picture will show you how the whole coast and the whole section of that sediment cell is linked together. You can see the sources of the cliffs on the left, where a lot of the sediment comes from. You can see how it gets transported along the coast in longshore drift in it, and some of it is placed in beaches and sand dunes. Some of it is then trapped by another um, feature like a bar. We can see another source, an estuary. And all of this section is separated by those two large headlands, on the, both the very left hand side and the right hand side which makes this whole sediment cell work, and separates it from other sediment cells. When exploring sediment cells, it's extremely important for us to consider the human impact as well. For people who are trying to look at the best way to manage a coast, they must consider sediment cells, because in too many instances, people tend to look to build sea defences, like a sea wall or riprap or a revetment, in an area where the budget is saying that it's an area of erosion and sediment should come from that area. When you do this, what you do is you starve other areas of this coast from sediment. Say, for example, if you look at a, a coast that you have blocked uh, erosion, that will reduce the amount of deposition uh, that is happening and the amount of transportation that's happening further down the coast, potentially exacerbating a problem that you have there. This obviously can cause very, very large issues and can be very damaging to the coast and can lead to you spending more money than you need to in the first place. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, please like. And if you'd like to see more content of this nature, Subscribe for other videos. Thank you and have a really great day.